I, uh, I love that song. It's, uh, it's, it's one of our favorites in our household, and it's, it's such a simple message, yet it's such a beautiful message. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know, I know that he's watching me. Uh, Sevilla Martin, she's the one that actually wrote this, this it was a poem, and it was later uh, put to music by Charles Gabriel, and, and Mrs. Martin um, she drew an inspiration from listening to a story of a friend that she was visiting with, but also uh, coming to mind was Matthew 10, 29, where it says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And God, he is, he is sovereign over all. He knows. He knows where all the sparrows are in the sky. He knows their every move. And then there's us. And he cares so much more for us. He watches over you, and he's watching over me. It's, and it, this is the thing. It's not, it's not, a, wish, it's not a wishful thinking. It's not, it's not something that you just say to yourself to make you feel better. God's why. It's, it's not that. It's, it's, and it's not an empty platitude. It's truth. God is in control. God is Lord over all. And God is with us. And so I think that's why Jesus says what he says in uh, Matthew 6.25. And you'll, you, Brother Chad will read this with you in a little bit. But here's, here's what Matthew 6.25, it's on the screen. It says, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life. And God says, I, I'm in control. I've got this. Trust me, don't worry. He also says it two other times in our passage this morning. In verse 31, he says, don't worry. In verse 34, he says, don't worry. If you read those in the Greek, those aren't suggestions. Those aren't things that you, you kind of think about. Those aren't things where you agree, disagree. Those, those are actual commands. So, and, and what do we call it when we break one of God's commands? Those of you who've grown up in church, what do you call it when you break one of God's commands? Sin. Yeah, you call it sin. And so... Worry, worrying is a sin? Uh, yes, it is. But I, I, when I'm reading this, here's what I'm thinking. But how am I supposed to stop worrying? How am I supposed to stop worrying? Doesn't God see what type of world that we're living in? Doesn't God know my life? Doesn't God see my, my family? Doesn't God know my finances? Doesn't God understand the stress that I'm under day after day? Doesn't God see what's happening in, in my relationships? Doesn't God see that, that my, my, my aging parents, their health is failing? Doesn't God see that I just, got a, I just got a negative diagnosis? Doesn't God see what's going on? Doesn't he see my life? It's falling apart. Looking at everything in my life sometimes, or our lives sometimes, worrying actually seems like an extremely appropriate response. And worry is a storm. We're in a series called Stormproof, and worry is a storm that I'm going to go out on a limb and say that every one of us face. We all face the storm of worry. Now, I want to make sure that you understand that when I say I'm, I'm talking about worry, I'm not talking about anxiety, the, the, the mental illness that so many people deal with. Worry, worry that's left unchecked um, can definitely lead to that. But what, what I'm talking about today is, is and what we're talking about is the worry that we all face because we all go through storms. We don't always talk about it because worry is kind of one of those, those sins that has just kind of become acceptable in our world today. Um, because we'll say things. People will tell you, and maybe you've said some of these things too. It's, oh, I, I get why you're worried. Um, you, you were right. You were right to be worried. Um, I, I would be worried too. Uh, a little worry never hurt anybody. And when you worry, it just means that you, you care or you're really concerned. And matter of fact, if you didn't worry, I would worry about you. And all those things make it sound like worry is, is really okay. But if worry was okay, then here's my question. Why would Jesus say, don't worry? Don't worry. Worry, like any other sin, is, is basically it's just taking our eyes off of God and focusing back on ourselves. But here's the deal. I, I think most followers of Christ, and actually even if you're here today and you don't, you're not a follower of Christ, like Chad said, your mom drug you here, so you're here. I, I, I know all of us, we don't want to worry. Worrying is not fun. It's not something that we should do. We don't want to do. Uh, and as believers, we know God, we love God, but we still worry. 
And it makes me think of this passage in Mark. It's Mark 9, 24. Some of you know the background of this, but it says, Immediately the father of the boy cried out, I do believe. And then I want you to say this last line with me. Help my unbelief. Say that again. Help my unbelief. I think this is one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible because it really captures the reality of life. God, I know you're in control. I know you love me. I know you're watching over me. I know you're with me. I know you're God. But help my unbelief. So what happened? I mean, this man, uh, if you don't know the background, this man had brought um, his son who, who, who was basically possessed by an evil spirit. Um, and I don't know how old the boy is, but it's basically it's, it's his whole life. So he may be a, a teenager. He may be a young man by this point. He may be a, an older man, and, and this is a, an, his older father. And, but he, he brought him to Jesus' disciples, and the disciples weren't able to, to heal this man. And so Jesus comes in, amongst the commotion, and he steps in, and he talks to the dad. And the dad his basic, basically says, if, if you can do anything, please do it. And Jesus' response was, if? If? And he goes, don't, don't you believe? And the question really wasn't about whether Jesus had the power to heal the, father, or heal the son, but it was whether the father had the faith to believe that Jesus could. You see, the father believed, but in an amazing show of honesty in front of the son of God, he asked Jesus to help him overcome his unbelief. You see, to me sometimes I think about the opposite of faith it's worry. What happened between, what, what do you think happened between I believe and help my unbelief? Well, you know what it was? It, it, it was worry. Worry says, what if it doesn't work? What if he really can't heal him? What if he's a fraud? What if this is a waste of time? What if this is not enough? And I've been there, and, and maybe you have too. We've all been in the spot where worry steps in in between us and God, and let me tell you something, worry never fixes anything. In fact, it only makes things worse. So God, he tells us, he commands us, do not worry. And here's the great news, and you're going to hear more about this. And because God commands it, it means he's going to empower us to do it. We don't have to worry because God will never let go of you and me. I invite you to open your Bibles to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. While you're making your way to Matthew chapter 6, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we got Matthew. I'll tell you a story. There was a man, his name was Joe. Joe used to worry about everything. In fact, Joe's friends just knew him as worrying Joe. He always was burdened, always fearful, always weighed down with worry. One day, Bill, who had been a longtime friend of Joe, tried to encourage him through the years. Bill sees Joe coming down the, down the street. And, well, he's just about skipping along. He's got a big smile on his face. He's, he's whistling, humming a tune back and forth. And, and, and here's the thing, Bill... Bill just realized that some radical transformation has happened in the life of his friend. Like he didn't have a care in the world. He could, he could hardly believe his eyes. He hadn't seen him in several weeks. And suddenly he's a completely new person. So he stopped Joe. He hollered at him. He said, hey, Joe, uh, man, what has happened to you? You don't seem like you have a care in the world. You're not worried about anything. T tell me. Tell me what's taking place. I've never seen anyone so happy. And Joe said, oh, it's wonderful, Bill. I haven't worried in weeks now. I've, I've, been, I've been set free from my worries. My life has been completely changed. He said, tell me about it. What's your story? How did you manage this, th this incredible turnaround of how you see the world, how you see life? And he said, well, it's easy. I, I found a guy. I hired him to do all my worrying for me. He said, well, I'm, I'm glad it's helping. Uh, just out of curiosity, what does he charge you? He said, well, he charges $1,000 a week. Now, he knew a little bit about Joe's, Joe's uh, economic position, and he said, 
how how are you affording a thousand dollars a week to pay this guy to do all your worrying for you? And Joe said, "Well, that's the beauty of it. That's his worry." <laughs> you know, there we go. That's just for me. Sometimes I wish I wish worrying was that easy, but it's not. Worry is a thief, and it comes uh, with some partners in crime. It'll rob you of your joy, rob you of your peace. It'll rob you of a lot of things. But it also comes with discouragement, despair, distraction, just deflation, disbelief. We worry about everything, right? Worry about our health, worry about our money, worry about, worry about our nation, worry about the future, worry about terrorism in the world, worry about our children, worry about retirement, worry about, worry about death. And sometimes in our despair, we start to worry even about God's faithfulness, God's love, God's uh, steadiness with us. Worry, as we might, it is never right. I want to start reading in Matthew. This Again, this is from the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 is well where we'll start. And here's uh, how Jesus starts painting the picture. And we have to get these first few verses that we're going to read today because they set the pace for a lot of other things we're going to come to understand. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Uh, We worry a lot about the treasure we're storing up because that is uh, insecure. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where the thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So the light with, if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, since either he'll hate one, love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. But you cannot serve both God and money. Now verse 25. Therefore, which uh, we'll note again in a moment, when you find a therefore in the Bible, what's it there for? It's there to point back to 19 through 24. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Isn't life more than food and body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? Why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, Oh, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But, verse 33, uh, central to the whole Sermon on the Mount, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness And all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus says in verse 25, Therefore, I tell you. And when Jesus tells us something, he's speaking with all the authority that is his as the Messiah, the Son of God. This is the divine word of God himself. It is not your favorite podcast or your favorite advice uh, giver or celebrity endorser. This is the holy word of Almighty God. And what he says is, do not worry. Do not worry about your life, verse 25. The solution to worry is simple. (laughs) It's simple. Just stop it. And that's the conclusion of the sermon today. (laughs) Just stop it. It's a little harder than that, isn't it? It is for me. I lay it down and I pick it right back up because uh, I start thinking maybe I need to top this thing off. Maybe I'm going to do a little scrambling. And somehow I think my worrying is making everything better. 
Jimmy said, it's a command. It's not a suggestion. Jesus didn't say, well, do your best and not get weighed down by worry. He just said, don't do it. Imperative, a command. And when we're worrying, we're breaking the word of God. Uh, the clear translation, just stop. Stop worrying. Uh, okay, so here we are. We all gathered up in here this, this morning. And you came in. and Different levels, different things, different priorities and all that stuff. But we all came in here and something's on your mind. Something you came in and you're hauling it. It's on your shoulders. You know it's there. And what is that thing? Your thing. I mean, I came in today. I know I, it's, it's easy for me to name mine. I know exactly what is kind of weighing on me. And I'd like to offload it. I'd like to close the books on this one and move beyond. But it's still there and it still weighs. And What's that thing for you? What are you worrying about? And here's, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. Stop it. Now, all better? Not yet. Okay. Well, good, because I still have some more sermon to go. Present tense continual action command. That means not just stop it for a moment, but you keep on. You, you turn it over to the Lord. You stop it all of the time. And there's a decision. And you know what? When Jesus says, stop, stop worrying, lay aside your worries, he's, he's also asking her to do something that he can enable you to do. And you're going to need his help on the big stuff. You need help on the small stuff. But he's not going to ask you to do something. He won't empower you to do. So we know it is possible to do it and do it in a moment even. Jesus uh, means that these words should apply to every dimension of our lives down to basic necessities of life. And so that's why he gives those illustrations. There are plenty of other bigger things we'd say in the world. But what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? The basic things that we do to live life. People in a third world, they were worried a whole lot more about those things than most of us are. We're not too worried about having clothes to wear, not worried, too worried about where, where our next meal's coming from. If we have water to drink, uh, we all came in with problems, anxieties, burdens, but Jesus is clear. Don't be anxious about them. Don't be burdened. Don't be stressed. Don't be weighed down. Don't be discouraged. And every time you worry, just download that to God. He will worry for you. He'll take care of it for you. You can trust Him. The Bible says, give all your worries and cares to God, for He cares about you. Invited, commanded by God, carry our burdens. Part of this is we fail to understand God really is control. That sovereignty of God thing. God is Lord over all. And we become anxious over the future. And we start wondering about his loving care. We say, yes, but I know God's God. I know God's powerful. I know God is sovereign. I know God's in charge. But a theological understanding of that really doesn't relieve us of most of our worries. doesn't guarantee we'll be worry-free. And as a result, Jesus says, there are just some things that to, to get there, to that stop worrying, there's some things we need to make sure that we have squared away so when Jesus said, for this reason I say to you, do not be anxious, do not worry, he's pointing back to some of those key factors in the verses just above. Here's some things that just must be true about our lives and some things we need to see and need to understand. Here's, I gave you several of these, and you might want to jot these down. Some of them are going to be squared away, clear, all settled in your heart, in your life, and some of these things you're going to say, I was going pretty good until I got to that one. And that's where it's breaking down for me. And that's where your point of application comes in. So make note of these. Here's the first one. We just need to see life as God sees life. Get that God perspective. Now, where do you get a God perspective? You get a God perspective from the Word of God. Here's, uh, here's what we say. As long as we view life the same way the rest of the world does, we're living for temporary things. It's all about money. It's all about power. It's all about my stuff. It's all about right here and right now. If, if you see the world as all right here, right now, the way people who don't have any relationship to God, any respect for the Word of God, any knowledge of a relationship to Christ, if we're living the same life they are, we're going to worry. Because here's the thing, those things are never going to be stable. Those things are never going to be secure. They're never going to deliver everything they promise us either, no matter what the advertising world tells us. So we're going to have to adopt a godly value system to our life. 
we must allow God to be in charge. He's Lord, he's king, he's master. No one can serve two masters. Since he'll either hate one and love the other, he'll be devoted to one, despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money or God and something else, anything else. Uh, you have to decide. I, I, I'm, I am declaring Jesus is Lord. And there is no other. There's not a competition. He's not just first in my life. He's in charge of the whole package. As long as we choose to be on the fence about that, as long as you choose to, well, I, yeah, I'm trusting. I trust God, except for the part where I don't, which is how a lot of, when we talk about him as Lord, that, that's how it actually uh, fleshes out. Is he really Lord? Is he really in charge? Only then will we have peace of mind and peace of heart and a worry-free life when we he, decide he's, he's Lord, he's master, he's king. Second thing is we need to understand the faithfulness of God. Jesus continues in verse 26. Probably some of you have been to Israel. You go to the traditional site always of the Mount of Beatitudes where the Sermon on the Mount supposedly took place. It's a beautiful hillside in the Sea of Galilee. and There are birds flying around, uh, in my experience, being there a couple of times. And I think that Jesus, so much, so much of the illustration material that he uses in his teaching is because there's some there's an application point in view of the crowd he's talking to i think he says consider consider the birds and there are birds flying around doing their doing their bird thing you see the birds don't don't miss a sermon illustration from god he says they're flying around that hillside by the sea and he says they're not planting seeds and harvesting a crop and storing away uh, what they're harvesting. Now, Jesus is not saying the birds are just sitting on a tree limb waiting for some food to find them. You know, you know, birds, birds are busy. They're always flying around, always searching, always seeking, always trying to find something to eat. However, they're not worried about it. He doesn't prohibit work. He doesn't prohibit us doing our due diligence. What he does prohibit is worrying about it. Because your heavenly father feeds them. I think they were feeding right then. and That's not just their effort. But it's God providing what they're, they're eating. Are you, much, are, are you not much more valuable than a bunch of birds? If God gave you life. Well can't you trust him? He's going to provide for all that life requires. Sometimes challenges are tough. This is my one Mother's Day story in this message. It comes from the great theologian, Jerry Clower. How many of you know who Jerry Clower is? Okay, a lot of you, that's just because you're old. But uh, He's a wonderful comedian, and he told this story. And it's one of my favorite things he ever told about family and about moms. He told a story about a mother who had 16 children, 16 children. And... Their house uh, near a construction project. And one day, about a half dozen of her kids, they were just out playing really close to the construction project. Here comes one crying, screaming, Mama, Mama, you got to come, you got to come. Uh, she ran to the site. And she found that one of her children had fallen into a barrel of roof tar. Now, it wasn't hot. It was going to cause some skin irritation for sure, but it wasn't hot. It wasn't, the child wasn't in danger of life, but... Just covered from head to toe with roof tar. And Clower said that the mom, she looked at him, just the awfulest mess she could imagine, and she said, you know, I think it'd be easier to have another one than to clean this one up. <laughs> wow. When it comes to, some of you have been in that spot, haven't you? I don't know. I don't know. You know, when it comes to the faithfulness of God, Think about this. How many times has our Creator, our Lord, been in a position where He looked at any of us and said, it might just be easier to save another one than to try to keep cleaning this one up. But that's not how He does it. He sent His one and only Son to die on a cross to pay for your every sin, to purchase you a place in eternity with Him in heaven. Don't you think, after He went to all that effort, He's going to care for you today. 
Here's the third thing we don't need, we need to understand the ineffectiveness of worry. And this is the key part of this. Have you ever noticed all the resume of accomplishments that comes from worry? And really, this is, this is something I preach this one to myself a lot because I, my inclination is to rehash and to consider and to run scenarios and to think of everything that could and might and has gone wrong. And so this is a place of battle in my own spirit. And, uh, but here's the, you know, as a general rule, this probably isn't too far off. It's been suggested 90% of the things we worry about never actually take place. Uh, it's at least that probably. Never take place. Totally out of our control and we could worry about it, but we couldn't control it anyway. Worry is not only sinful, it's just a waste of time. It doesn't accomplish anything. And so that's a key part of worry. There are different translations of uh, verse 27 where it says, can any of you add, my, my translation here says, add one moment to his lifespan. Uh, some of you, the older translations go the literal route and say cubit. You know what a cubit is? You can add one cubit to your lifespan. One, it's a measure. Cubit, now the typical distance between a grown man's fingertip and his elbow is about 18 inches was a unit of measure. So you find lots of cubits in the Old Testament and New Testament. But the idea is, can, can you make your life any longer by worrying? The truth is, you probably shorten your life. The stress and the anxiety uh, do things to your body physiologically that it may actually make your life shorter, not longer. Stress, fear, wear you down. But there's another, another way that that can be translated because we find it in other examples of Greek literature of the time. And here's the idea, back to the cubit and how the words come together. Another possibility is, can any of you, by worrying, make yourself taller? Okay, and I want you to consider this. In, there's a guy, Bible scholar, who actually has deep roots in Allen, uh, Ray Summers. Uh, he's a fascinating guy. He taught at Southwestern Seminary at Baylor University for a good while. and He's a well-known scholar, now another generation, but he has deep roots in Allen, Texas. In fact, I've told you the story before that the song, The Nail-Scarred Hand, was written uh, early part of last century at First Baptist Church, Allen, Texas, by B.B. McKinney. The reason we know that is because Ray Summers knew it. And he's the one that, uh, that told that story. So, Ray Summers. Well, Ray Summers, in his commentary on Luke's gospel, he takes this route with the translation. He's a Greek scholar at the highest level. Summers said that the average Jewish man in Jesus' time was about five feet tall. Now, I know that really messes you up because every time they do a movie about Jesus, you know, he's about 6'3", and golden brown hair, and uh, white robe, blue sash, right? Yeah, look just like a Jewish man would look. No, he's a European guy in all those things, a Jewish man. Jesus, probably one of the Jewish people of the time, he's about five feet tall. How about that? That... This, this may be the part that wrecks your whole Mother's Day to uh, reconsider this. And at the time, we have an occupying military force of Romans, and typically the Romans were bigger, they were taller, and the Jewish people uh, always felt like their, their occupying force looked down on them. I mean, looked down on them because they were looking down on them, and they hated the Romans uh, because they had that sense of disdain for the Jewish people. And Jesus just states the obvious. Uh, they could worry all they wanted about that, but it wasn't going to make them an inch taller. In effect, Jesus said, your life has certain boundaries, and you're just going to have certain limitations, and you can't do anything about those things. A lot of things we worry about, we have no control over. We can't manipulate them in any way. And so he says, why don't you just embrace the things that you can't change, and go on and live your life because worrying about those things is not going to make your life one little bit better. Maybe sometimes you say, okay, I've been worrying about this about me or that about me or my life. Well, you know what? Uh, why don't I just seek to be the best me that I can be as God has made me? Fourth thing, we need to understand God's watch care over us. 
And here's the point. It, verses 28 through 30. If God provides so well for the grass of the field, it's going to be there for a season, and then it's going to be gone. Well, my goodness, if, if he's doing that for the grass of the field, won't he surely care for those of us who were created for eternal glory to be with him forever? It doesn't mean that God's always going to provide the latest fashions. And in these verses, uh, he seems to be really hammering down on the, on the clothes part of this. It may have been a big deal. One of the things you forget in this world, in this time, with most of these people, is that, and we, those of you who have spent some time in mission efforts in third world places, you know, this is true there today, no different than then, that people had two sets of clothes. And they wore one, and they wore them for several days, and then they put on the other set of clothes, and they washed the first set. And that was the, that was the routine. You didn't have, oh my goodness, I think about the people that Jesus is talking to if you walked them through houses in Collin County, and they saw, oh my goodness, my, my whole family lives in a space, a family of 10 can live in a space smaller than that closet those people have. That we, we love our clothes, we love our stuff. Well, Jesus is saying, I think you may have taken a wrong turn on worrying about so much the outward appearance, your adorning of yourself. There's a greater principle, the active watch care of God. Oh, men of little faith. Jesus used that five times in the Gospels where he said, oh, men of little faith. And it seems to describe those who are not taking to heart the comfort they have derived from the presence, the power, the provision of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's, here's one for you. And this is an amazing thing, and I get caught in this, and this is my favorite reminder to right my spirit when I get caught in this loop of worry, is that people, like a lot of us, who have trusted trusted the Lord for our eternal soul salvation and heaven forever we have no problem taking that faith step but we can't trust him for our bank account for our job for our children for our health we can't trust him with much lesser things you see where the disconnect is there he cares for you at the highest levels of your eternal soul he can he can get involved. He cares deeply about those lesser things too. Fifth thing, we need to understand our position in Christ. So Jesus draws this contrast between those who live according to his will and teachings and those who do not belong to him. And those who don't belong to him, you expect they're just going to be chasing earthly things, uh, temporary things, lesser things. Because where else can they turn? But for believers, we can turn to the higher things because we turn to the things of God. Verse 33, seek. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek means being absorbed in the search, perseverance in the search, strenuous effort to obtain. It's the overall driving force of your life. And you ought to be seeking God to give him the priority, to give him that, that which is his due. And this is God's promise. When you do that, First, not just first among, well, he, like, uh, oh, there was one of the, I uh, was reading the newspaper this morning, and uh, sports section is talking about the state track meet yesterday. And, like, four runners that were way less than a second apart in how they finished the race. It's, it's not talking about first, like, by three-tenths of a second. It's talking about God first as Lord over all in all, above all, it's not a close race. Seek to make him first in our lives. Shift your burdens to him, and it is his delight to meet our needs. Therefore, we no longer have to worry. And then, six, we need to understand our needed God focus. Since worry is anxiety about the future... Worry never accomplishes anything of value because focusing our attention on tomorrow is unproductive because all we've got is today. And again, this is not to imply that you don't carefully plan and plan ahead. 
There's things, wisdom. Wisdom is defined in scriptures and in the Proverbs. There's the ant, and the ant stores up for the winter when it's, there's opportunity. So even something as dumb and small as an ant has sense enough to prepare for the future, to do some provision for the future. We, we certainly should as well. That's just the nature of wisdom. And by God's grace, when you do that, many of tomorrow's problems can be avoided. Sometimes we, we create our own disasters. But the future cannot be improved by worrying about today. Worrying today. Trouble here means something that is evil by man's point of view. And you will appreciate how this is used in other places in Greek literature. You get the nuance of some of these words. Trouble is, this word is applied to crop damage because of hailstorms multiple times. How many of you have had any hail damage uh, recently? Yeah. How many of you, well, I felt this as a, I stood uh, over here, building E, and there I am, and I'm just watching as hail rains down on my fairly new car. And, you know, what do you do? Throw yourself over? Oh, what? You know what? There's nothing I can do to make that stop hitting my car. And uh, there's not much use in throwing myself into that battle just now. Trouble uh, of this type will come into the life of a believer. We talk about storm proof. We've said this uh, every week. We'll continue to say it for the next two weeks as we think about storm proof. It doesn't mean you can keep a storm from coming. It doesn't mean that difficulties won't happen. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. There are a lot of things about spiritual growth that just aren't ever going to happen until we are pressured, we are pushed, we are stretched. And God cares a whole lot more about our, our eternal spiritual development than he does about our temporary comfort. He guarantees those things will happen, but he also guarantees he'll give us the grace to meet those troubles when they occur. So anxiety, worry is fruitless it paralyzes us we worry about today tomorrow next week and it's never going to be helpful but if we'll remember God is God and God loves us and he will help us prepare to at least not be caught flat footed when the storm comes but he'll also give us the strength to recover because that's what God does. And this world is not heaven, the perfect place where everything always goes great, but he's preparing us for heaven. And if we'll trust him, uh, the road between here and there will be a time of testimony and grace and glory.